I invite you to turn your Bible, if you would, to 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. We're going to look at the first seven verses this morning. As you turn to that page, I just want to tell you this. You know, I believe that the Word of God, the Bible, the whole Bible, is a pure Word of God. All right? In other words, that there's nothing in the Bible that is, uh, you know, supposed to be hidden or, you know, not to be spoken about. The Bible is for everyone, for every age. Do you believe that? There is no Bible section when it says only for adults or for children. <coughs> you know, too many times that uh, we segregate the Word of God because the lack of understanding of it. Because of our circumstance, our, our, our experience, things that uh, influence, you know, our thoughts, our ideologies, or our culture. You know, the, since the beginning, when I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ over almost 23 years ago, the Word of God, every time I open, there is always something in there that always, always... If you want to use the word, the term today, offend me or even to, you know, cut me. If you look at the book of Acts, when Peter spoke the word of God, the Bible says the, men, the heart of the men were cut. There are many times even when the apostles preaching, the Bible says the, men, the heart of the people were cut. The word cut in there means they were heavily convicted. But then because the spirit of God in there and the hearts were humble, the Bible says the crowd says... What shall I do, man, brethren? What shall I do? And then Peter says, repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Repent and believe. I remember when I was young, when I was really young, of course, I grew up in church. And um, there is one book that was forbidden for me to read in the Bible. And that book was the Psalms of Solomon. <laughs> You laugh about it because you know what I'm going with this. Because it's very graphic in that book, of course. And if you're a young age, of course, you don't understand that. I remember I asked one in Adele. I can't remember if it was my parents or somebody in the church. But I remember I asked it because I read it. To be honest with you, after I read it, I was like, what in the world is this? And then I, um, I asked this adult person in the church. And it says, oh... Don't worry about it right now. Read it later when, when, the, when you get into that age. Am I thinking like what age is that? <clears throat> and you know the truth, I'll be honest with you. I've never, I've never before studied or understand the book of Psalms of Solomon. I've never really took time or anybody to teach me the book, the book of Solomon until, get this now, until on my third year at Bible College, on the third year of the Bible College, it was all over four years. On the third year of Bible College, I started to, uh, someone came up in the chapel. We have chapels every Thursday. And this man spoke on the book of Song of Solomon. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I've never heard somebody preach from the book of Song of Solomon. And not just one or two verses, but the whole book. He summarized the whole book in that one uh, hour chapel that we had, the one hour preaching that we had in there. And man, I tell you, it was very impactful. But then I couldn't understand the whole thing because in an hour it's hard to understand all of that. So then I took time to study that book of Song of Solomon. And always keep in mind that every letter, every book in the Bible, the focus is always upon Jesus Christ. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, all books in the Bibles, the center of the message, always about Christ, Jesus Christ. And I read the book of Song of Solomon in Christ at the center of it. I seen a picture as what the speaker was preaching in there. It says a picture of Christ and his bride, the church. The intimacy between Christ and the church and the church with Christ. How it should be. Not in the physical imagination. But in the sense of 
The intimate, they said, you know, that what expressed in the book of that Song of Solomon is really deep. In 20 years, church, I'm just going to be honest, lay this out before you. 20 years of ministry that I, I started out back in the year 2000 in the church, I've seen many, many, many Christians who got hurt, whose testimony had been damaged, that they had become, in a way, useless to God in the ministry. And the area of this, what we've been talking about since last week, about in the area of sexual immorality. And usually in churches, people deal after things happen. They usually handle this as, oh, now this has happened, let's, let's <laughs> talk about this. I imagine if that was my daughter, if, it was, if I neglect to tell them the whole truth of the Word of God and everything that it says in this, and then something happened to her because she has no knowledge of it, but she found the knowledge from somewhere else or from the wrong places. I be judged by God, not being a good steward to the one that God's given to me to teach them the truth. When I'm doing ministry in the youth, there's always this issues with datings and Boys liking girls, girls who go gaga about guys, and all those things, vice versa. And the reason why, well, first of all, it is part of the nature, isn't it? For one to like the other and things. But sometimes they're allowing the Hollywood uh, you know, influence and all of these media is influencing the YouTube's influencing their minds to make them to be like what they wanted to be or to be like somebody else that they're not. Some want to be like, the Kardashian, some, oh, is that the right no name? I, I don't know. You know. Some want to be like, you know, uh, other people, they're just like, oh yeah, you know, the life like that. And it's popular, yes. But I think here, listen, church, <clears throat> I think that I would be judged by God if I would not speak of that matter, especially it's in His Word. What I'm going to speak to you today, it is from the Word of God. And as a, as a man that God has called to the ministry, I promised God from the beginning that I will not let myself or anything to get in the way from the truth of the Word of God, the wholesome of it. I know today we're living in the, what we call PC, politically correct. But I am a BC, I'm a biblically correct. Amen. First and most of all, than anything. So therefore, I'm going to boldly preach the Word of God, and I want you to listen, and with a humble heart, ready to receive of this word because this is important church I do not want to see this happen in our church I don't want to see this in any of our brothers and sister churches sister churches anywhere because this something like this happen could destroy or devour like the Bible says the person and the church as well amen to that church amen. so let's pray together father God as you have brought me into this place in the passage in 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. Lord, you know my heart. You know that I've been pursuing this study with all kinds of different things in my mind and my heart. But God, when I keep my eyes and my heart upon you alone, I have nothing else to do but then just to do what you have called me to do and to speak what you want me to speak out of your word. Father, I pray may nothing be a hindrance to the delivery of, delivery of this message. May our minds, our, our uh, preconcept ideas, our past, our cultures, everything will not be influencing of how we receive this word. But God, may this word be received with a pure heart, the heart of desiring to love you more, the heart of desiring to testify you as a living God, living Christ in this place, in this community, in this world. Lord God, I pray, you will be done right here as it is in heaven. For in Jesus Christ's name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Marriage. Marriage. By a dictionary definition, marriage is a legal or formal recognition or recognized union 
of two people as partners in a personal relationship. That's according to Oxford Dictionary. A legal or formal recognized union, two people as partners in a personal relationship. It's very general, very generic definition, isn't it? And then there's a footnote under that that says, usually, usually between a man and a woman. Usually, on the parenthesis in the dictionary, if you look at it. Of course, there's a new impro improvised one. You know, marriage is a popular thing. Most people somehow believe in marriage. Most people like to get married. Uh, a lot of people are today, even the one that uh, don't understand about marriages. And that's the problem today. In our society, in our world today, marriage has less value. Or the value of marriage is the same thing like a friendship in a way, like a partnership contract in a business. A lot of marriages made out of 50-50 agreement. If I do 50, my, my spouse do 50, we'll be just fine. After a year in the marriage, or before the year is ended, on the first year, they started to question how much is your 50 and how much is my 50. I feel like I'm done 70, you've only done 30. And then the other part person says, no, I've done 80 and you've only done 20. And there's the beginning, the ring of the fight, isn't it? The argument. Too many marriages is made up or it's, it's, you know, it's done only because based upon feelings or upon culture, traditional obligations. Because a pressure in the community or the society that something has to be taking place. You know, especially the, four, the popular thing that if you are a lady, you're, you're in your 40s and you're not married, it's like, you know, there's something wrong with you. Have you heard that before? You know, they say, they can stay like the wall, you're already 35, oh, you, your time is clicking, your clock is clicking. <laughs> you know, and then so you'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, any man here who can give me babies or can make me a wife, you know? Man, and we, we laugh about it because we're living in an advanced society, but I'll tell you this, you don't have to go far away to find people like this. In this chapter 7, Paul exposed everything about from marriage, from celebrity, you know, being single, what is that, and all of that. And both, the Bible says, Paul says, by God's divine revelation, that both are gift from God. Either you're married or you're single, both are gifts from God. Amen. Speaking of Paul, he was a man that never married. Or some even convinced that maybe he was a widow, that his wife died. We don't know about it. We find out when we get to heaven. We'll talk to Paul about it. But the truth is here, Paul, as far as, as, far as we know in the scripture, he's, he's alone. He's, he's a, a one single man. We talk about it in our class, at BTC class of church history, and we look at the book of Acts of Paul's journey. You know, three missionary trips, actually four of them, even after he was being uh, released from the Roman uh, uh, you know, prison. He still went around and preached the gospel, and then in a time of Nero, of course, at the end of his journey, he was beheaded for the sake of Christ. He accomplished so much in a short time for the glory of God. Why? Because God gave him a gift of being single. It's a gift. And marriage is also a gift. We'll look at that a little bit later tomorrow, next week. But today I want you to look at this, something that is a struggle in the church of Corinth. And then there's a struggle in many churches. I was looking at surveys. I always like, like surveys because I like just to know something. In, the, in, in, in one of the surveys, a Christian survey actually, they said that in many evangelical churches, there are many divorces. Many divorces in the evangelical churches. <clears throat> And, you know, I think that you can testify, you've been to some churches perhaps that have couples that have been divorced or separated, split, whatever the term is. You've heard about that, haven't you? And unfortunately, unfortunately, it happened in churches. So guess what? If it happened in churches, then what the world sees up there, they were like, you know what? <laughs> Your marriage is not better than I do, than in mine. Your marriage is going down the drain. And you go to church, I don't have to go to church, I'm smarter than you. Why? Because then I don't have to waste my time going to church because my life is just like yours and yours is like mine. There's something about marriage. Do you know that marriage is the first, the very first institution that God made? God created. 
That the very first institution before there was government, before there were kings, before there were anything else, God created marriage. God gave marriage. And marriage, if you study the word of God, is the very foundations of the glory of God that he wants to reveal in the world and through. Through marriage. We cannot take marriage lightly, church. In the scripture, we look at many passages where God said the two shall become one flesh. But I want you to see in Matthew 19, just in the back of the screen, when it says in verse 5, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. You see the word one flesh repeating again and again. Therefore, what God has joined together, listen to this couples, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Who's stronger than God? If anybody can tell me? Who is bigger or greater than God? Anybody? No. So what God has joined together, can anybody break that? Something you need to think about, church, in your relationship in your spouse. And by the way, I want you to talk about this to your young ones as well. Don't wait. Don't say like, oh, you're not waiting until they turn that turn. Today, young kids, I seen even from the elementary school before, they're dating already. When my daughter was in the primary school, they used to come home, you know, they said like, oh, so and so is dating now. I was like, what? You guys don't even know how to change your clothes on your own. When you already said dating and Google Gaga and somebody kiss on the cheek and all that. I was like, wow, this is wild. Isn't it? Church, where, what, what's in, this, in our society, in school, they have what you call puberty class. Have you heard that part about that? I, I signed my, my daughters off from that because I believe it is the parents' job to talk about that, not someone else. But then, you know, parents, because they just like, ah, oh, no, I'll just say, well, yeah, go over there, nothing wrong. Years ago, when I was at uh, IBC, before we started IBCC, I got parents, they were so furious, angry on Sunday, and came to me because their children were in our class. Their fear is because in the school that the, what the, one of the children attended, they had this, uh, demonstrations about how to have, you know, about puberty and all of that in front of big class and showing about there's a very vivid pictures and actually demonstration in front of the class and the parents just furious, furious about that. So they were angry telling me, oh pastor, I cannot believe, I cannot believe, I cannot believe, I cannot believe. I said, okay, believe it now. It's already happening. But let me ask you this. Have you talked about that to your children? Oh, no, no, no. Why not? Who's going to tell them? The nature? <laughs> oh, someone, they're going, someone's going to tell them. But it better come from the parents or from a godly person that can be entrusted by God to tell them the truth, the whole truth. Church, let's look at it in verse 1 to verse 6. In regards of this, what we talk about how today Marriage is the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ. Chapter 7, verse 1, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 
But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. We'll stop there. I want you to see two things this morning. Very important things. In the inside your bulletins, you find your insert of the message online. I want you to fill in those blanks up and then you can study it again at home and bring that as a meditation or as a devotion, perhaps also in your home for the whole family to listen to. The first I want you to see is the fundamental testimony of marriage in the church. The fundamental testimony of marriage in the church. Apostle Paul begins with the phrase, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So there was a letter that Paul received before he wrote this 1 Corinthians. And in that letter, it displayed all these issues that Paul talked about in the letter of 1 Corinthians. And now it comes down to this. Why did he say that, that now concerning the things which you wrote to me? Why do you have to remind the audience of this very thing? Because what Paul's talking about here, this is not some kind of make-believe in his mind. It's not something that he imagining that will take place. But it is happening in the church. And Paul says, now I want to talk to you about what someone already told you. And you know, the big possibility that man, named Sosthenes, who was the one that mentioned in chapter 1, a member of the lead, one of the leaders in that church, Wrote to Paul, says, here's the problem, here's the issues. And then, Paul, the next part of that verse 1, look at it, say, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. So many people stop the verse right there, and they make a conclusion. They're saying, like, see, it's not good for man, any man to touch any woman. There was a group of people that call uh, that to make themselves to be, you know, to be uh, the group of this, uh, like a monk, if you know what I mean. They not to touch the opposite sex whatsoever. They just stay so-called pure. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ confronted that kind of attitude when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to this Jewish leaders that have that kind of attitude as well, not to touch a woman and want to condemn women that have committed adultery. And then the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, if you look upon a woman and desire in your heart, you have already committed adultery. Wow. Can you imagine those religious people that are trying to not do away but then their mind? The Lord Jesus Christ knew their mind. Yeah, you don't touch a woman, but you already look upon it, that's already done. So then here it is. One thing I want you to look at, first we'll say it is good for a man. The word good in there is, is, is not really uh, um, justifiable, I guess. But the word uh, good in, English, in the original text of the Bible, it could also it means wise or honorable. So in other words, it is wise or it is honorable for a man not to touch a woman. Now the, when, I, when I studied this, I was trying to look at the word touch. What does that touching mean? Like, is that touching like touch, like high five? Is that like that? Or is that touching like kiss on the cheek? Or is it like, you know, up to the foot, like that? How are you doing, you know? Is that that kind of thing to touch? But then I discovered that actually the phrase touch a woman is repeated many times in the Bible. To touch a woman. The, the phrase sometimes in English used, to, like, for example, she's not with him or not being with him. Or, you know, when Mary and Joseph, remember, there were, she was not with the man or no, knew the man, knows the man, until the Lord Jesus Christ was born. That's the same, the same phrase or the same understanding. To touch a woman here means is to, is a euphemism in the Jewish culture for let me say this one time only. Sexual intercourse or for physical intimacy. I'm going to start using the word physical intimacy from now on. But I want you to know on this. that some people think that you cannot touch a woman. Meaning that in any ways. However, Paul, Apostle Paul, he wrote to the church of Corinth in Thessalonica, the church in Thessalonica, and even in, the, in Rome, he said this, listen to the phrase, he said, greet one another with a holy kiss. Is that a kiss in the air? Like, <laughs> <laughs> when I went to the whole Middle East and I, I seen how people in a common area, when I went to Israel, and uh, seeing people, you know, greeting one another, even the men, I'm not going to do it here. <laughs> I don't want to scare them. <laughs> they, they hold the people's head and they're like, 
You know, how does Maori does the home home? They put their head together and the nose together. I remember we were at this one of the, uh, uh, I, was, I was attending one of the uh, uh, citizenship ceremony. And then uh, there, there's this Maori man in the middle and giving no hongi to everyone. And then there's this one guy and he was like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, but uh, I had a good teacher, I had Pastor Cliff, that told me how to do that properly. You put the head together first and then you put the nose, you know. So you know you're there, not like. <laughs> but they, they touch each other, the, the ladies, and the, you know, if they know each other, they, they really kiss on the cheek three times, left, right, left, like that. And so those are the holy kisses they're talking about. Does that mean that's wrong? No, it's not. Because the very definition of that touch of woman, talking about being intimate in any ways, in any ways. Paul said it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Then Paul continued in there. If you look at the next part of that verse, in verse 2, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Her own husband. Some misinterpret this. Again, many people misinterpret it. Making this as an excuse to say that if a man or woman have some kind of desire in their heart or have committed some kind of sexual immorality, according to this verse, it says that you better have your own wife or get married. That's not what it says in here. Too many cultures think that marriage is the solution to sexual misconduct between a man and a woman. They think that marriage will resolve the issue and will cover multitude of sins. They, the very foundation of marriage actually is God and His love. That's the very foundation of marriage, God and His love. If the foundation of any, of any marriage is based upon anything else besides God and His love, then that marriage is already doomed for failure. What Apostle Paul stressed in this verse was that Physical intimacy only toward for is the man and his wife, whom God have united together. Then Apostle Paul, by God's divine revelation, he exposed to the church how godly marriage should be like. And right here, in this next two verses, verse 3 and 4, I want you to see two things really quickly. The first thing I want you to see, first is the faithfulness. Verse 3 talks about faithfulness. Let, him, let the husband, he says, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The word render, render, and the word, I mean, the phrase, render the affection due, means to give oneself to fulfill, get this, not just physical, to fulfill the wholesomeness of that person, spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of that of your spouse to comfort and to satisfy his or her need in the deeper, deeper uh, level that no human being can meet. Amen. Do you understand that? I know it's too long for definition, but it means to give oneself to to fulfill the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of your spouse to comfort and to satisfy his or her needs in a deeper level that no human being, other human being, can give. That's what it means when it says, render to the affection due, the affection you know, we are such a physical being, don't we? We like to, when we talk about affection, immediately think about physical things. Do you know that affection is not just physical? And actually, affections begin sometimes with words. Affection, look at how God being affectionate, being affectionate to us. He gave His Word. He said, 
God demonstrated his own love toward us. Before, yet when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How, we, how do we know that today? By his word. The word of God is so affectionate to us, isn't it? It meets the needs of our spiritual needs. It meets the needs of our emotions.